Hello, everyone. This is Keith Stone with the Center for Hellenic Studies, and this is another Cosmos Society online open house. Our guest today is Greg Naj, uh, our patron saint. Well, <laughs> maybe not quite our patron saint, but the director of our center. Um, but not a daimon. No. <laughs> <laughs> not, no, not in the bad sense, certainly. Not in the bad sense. Um, and uh, Greg, you've been interested recently in Pausanias um, uh, redoing a translation, the old uh, Jones translation, revising it and offering comments, which I should say the interested reader can find on a blog called Classical Inquiries, which I edit and which Greg posts at. Um, you've done the same thing for Homer, the Homeric epics, uh, some Pindar, and now Pausanias is the, the focus. Um, and this week, this coming week, you're going to be writing about Pausanias 127.3, well, a larger section, but including that section, yes. where we find the Arephoroi, um, Athenian girls who carry unknown ritual objects yes. uh, in a context that involves Athena and Aphrodite. Yes. So with that yeah. little introduction, Greg, I turn it over to you. And could I say to um, everybody out there, Anything I tell you is the opposite of the last word. I've never dealt with a subject more difficult, uh, a subject where so few people who are experts in Greek religion, quote unquote, agree. And, and, and with um, a subject that people can't even figure out on the basis of any one source. Pausanias, for me, is a good place to start um, in considering these um, are for oi. And the ending, oi, uh, should not be misunderstood as a masculine ending. This is an ending that works for both male and female referents. And in, in this case, they are female. And it's not clear what the etymology is. Um, a complication is the fact that in ancient sources, sometimes they're called arre foroi, with an alpha as the first letter. And in other contexts, they're called erre foroi, with an epsilon. Now, the variant that shows epsilon seems to be transparent and is therefore sometimes suspected of being a folk etymology, as linguists sometimes call it. Erre foroi would mean they who carry the do, D-E-W. Well, how can you carry the do? So you can already see their problems, um, except for the fact that the daughters of Kekrops, and that is the mythological counterpart, have names that do definitely convey not just the dawn, but the ritual experience of bivouacking um, in the environments, the countryside of Athens, Attica writ large. And this will be done primarily by uh, cadet citizens, sometimes called ephebi or ephebes. And one of the, one of the goddesses whom they worship is Aglaudos, which actually seems to mean bivouacking. It's um, um, Agraulos with metathesis, and that is to say, hanging out in the fields. And another, so that's one of the names of a, a local nature goddess. Um, whose name is invoked by the Ephibes in swearing by, their, by the gods who preside over their ritual activities. Oh, I'm already getting tired of all the details, or tiring uh, details tire me because there's so much to put together. In any case, we also have the problem of whether a name that applies to a goddess in some situation can apply to a hero or female hero in another situation. And that seems to be the case when we think of the daughters of Kekrops, who are 
let's see if I have it right. Agralos, which means bivouacking. Herse, which means dawn. And pandrosos, which means everything about dawn put together. And I, I, don't, I don't want to um, tire you with a retelling of the basic myth, but it has to do with the adoption of the earthborn son that Athena never had, because of course, by, by the fifth century and thereafter, she's a virgin goddess who cannot be a mother, but she can certainly be a substitute mother. And if we follow the um, research of Douglas Frame, 200 years earlier, um, in, in centuries preceding the fifth century, she was a mother goddess as well as a virgin goddess, recycling from one to the other. But again, to go back to the situation that Pausanias, second century CE, inherits, she's already a virgin and only a virgin. <coughs> in any case, um, the, the proto-Athenian, Erichthonios, is born of the earth and uh, th this this autochthonous baby which to which um, the earth mother herself Gaia aka gay gives birth hands over and we can see it in iconography to Athena uh, for caretaking and then Athena hands the baby over to the three daughters of Kekrops who have all these associations with initiation at dawn and all the dew that collects at dawn in a countryside that is otherwise very dry. And, and we know that um, in the myth, something that, that so upset them happened that is to say, the daughters of Keklops, when they opened the basket that they weren't supposed to open and, and saw what was in there. And what upset them was the baby, the autochthonous baby. And it seems to be in that moment that the, it seems that the baby is half human, half snake. And, I, and what upsets the, the girls, the three girls, the three daughters of Keklops, is they, they now understand fully that they themselves are half human, half snake, and I guess they've been in denial of that up until that moment. And I, I distorted the myth because only two of the daughters actually open the basket. The third one doesn't. The two that open it and see what they see um, are so upset that they commit suicide by jumping um, off the Acropolis. The third one uh, doesn't jump off because he hasn't, she hasn't seen um, the, the site there. Wow, I'm already uh, um, having a full plate. And, and um, so if now we read what Pausanias says, do we have time for me quickly to read it and for me to comment on it? Mm -hmm. Sure, definitely. I'll start with 1.27.3, where we see, um, I wouldn't say it in other contexts, but the religiosity of Pausanias, how he is a deeply religious person. Now I'll quickly undo the word religion by talking about myth and ritual, and I want us to understand um, a strict observance and respect for myth and ritual as what I mean when I say religiosity. And just look at the way he says it, the things about this that most of all cause wonder. And lately I've been using hyphens to indicate that I'm dealing with one word, and that's Thalmadzein, for me are not known to all, and so I will write down what happens. Well, thanks a lot, Pausanias, you'll write down what happens, but because he is so observant, he does not write down everything. He'll just write down what he thinks is uh, G-rated, so to speak. In other words, safe to talk about without getting into too many details that would be taboo. So here we go. For a time, they, that's the Arephoroi. Um, oh, oh I, I, I'm sorry, I didn't do the, uh, the previous um, part. Two maidens, Parthenoi, two virgins, dwell 
not far from the temple of Athena Polias. That's Athena, Our Lady of the city. It's the more important, from the point of view of myth and ritual, um, representation of Athena on the uh, on the Acropolis. The Parthenos, Parthenos in the Parthenon, is is shall we say more artistic and less ritual myth connected. And then he goes on. The Athenians called them the Areforoi. So there we are. But but you have to understand that they're Areforoi in myth and Areforoi in ritual. And uh, the ritual Areforoi reenact somehow and in in some ways purge what happens to the Areforoi in myth. So we hear next paragraph. For a time, they the Areforoi lived their life, diaita. And I deliberately say live their life. Diaita is the word that gives us diet, but it means diet in the sense of a regime, a life that is, uh, is um, constrained by ritual activity. Anyway, they live their life at the place, it should be of the goddess, I, I, I see. I forgot the word of. But when the festival comes round, and by this we mean the Panathenaic festival, and not necessarily the big one, the one that happens every four years, but the ordinary one, the so-called lesser Panathenaea. I'll explain why I make that distinction. Anyway, when the festival comes round, they ritually perform, and you notice I have the hyphen there, Dran is ritually performed, at night the following. They place on their heads what the priestess of Athena gives them to carry. Neither she who gives it knows what it is that she is giving, nor do they who carry it understand what it is. I like the way it says, understand what it is. And we're now thinking, well, this must be two are for Roy, and not the third one who was exempt from the suicide. So somehow it's two of the three from the point of view of myth, but it's two ritual participants. And, and as some of you know, I, I have worked eternities on the verb fero and foreo to carry and the ritual implications of this. And in, in the text that I hope to hand in to Keith, the editor of Classical Inquiries, by early next week, what I'll try to show is that the language the ritual language that Pausanias uses here corresponds to the ritual language of a very important linear B text that has to do with processions, that has to do with bringing offerings to um, various uh, superhuman entities. Notice I'm careful not to say divinities or cult heroes because they, they seem to be both. And so I, I think that what we see here in Pausanias is a very accurate, uh, phraseologically accurate description of a, of a myth that's so old that it must be, my goodness, um, let's see, 200, 1,000, oh my goodness, um, what, almost a, a thousand and a half years already uh, in existence. Well, let's continue. Now there is a precinct in the city, the precinct of Aphrodite in the gardens, as she is called. It is not far away, and there is an underground descending passage, and that's descending hyphen passage, the word is kathodos, the way down, that extends across it, the precinct, not artificially, but naturally, automate, <laughs> automatically, literally with a mind of its own. Again, I think very, uh, very precise ritual language. And then one more paragraph. By way of this passage, the maidens, the virgins, descend, katianai, again, very important ritual word, and down below, they leave behind the things they were carrying. And again, you have that ver verb, fero. And they take something else that they bring back, komidzeng, covered up. These maidens, after this, they dismiss. In other words, the people who run the festival then go ahead and dismiss this generation of maidens. And they now lead, and that's a very important word, again, 
up to the Acropolis, other maidens in their place. And the way uh, in the original Greek of Pausanias, the correlation of phero to carry and ago to lead somebody in a procession, that correlation is, I think, very interestingly um, channeled by Pausanias. Again, showing to me that we have here an extremely early um, um, ritual, a, a very old ritual, um, centuries and centuries and centuries old, um, that is preserved by the Athenians, even at this late, relatively late stage in Athenian history, second century CE, the era of Pausanias. Now I'm breathless. I'm sorry to have gone on for almost 20 minutes, but you see there's quite a lot here on our plate. I'll stop for a while. Oh, that's very interesting. Um, I was wondering, Greg, you mentioned, I think you said that one of the daughters of Kekrops has the same name as this field goddess. Is that right? Or very similar, yes, at least? Yes, yes. The same. Yes. Of, of Lauros, which means Miss Bivouacking. Okay. Our Lady of Bivouacking. Are there any other questions from anyone at the moment yes. while Greg is pausing? <laughs> yes. To catch his breath. I see, I see Astrid has one. Yes. Uh, I'll unmute you here. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, what really caught my attention is this is about two maidens. Yes. Yes, but they have to go through the uh, Garden of Aphrodite. They have yes. to go to Cape Kepoi. Yes. Before yeah. reaching the underworld, which is yes. yes. the climax of the ride. Yes. Yes. Does that mean that they have to reach maturity or from maiden go to womanhood before coming back to the Acropolis? Uh, I think that's a beautiful question. Uh, I, I, would, I, I would adjust it just a little bit that I, I think this whole trip is somehow a death to the old self and um, uh, a regeneration to the new self. So it, it's it's an initiation, anthropology 101 type of initiation. And, and I think when you do die to your old self, you do get upgraded in, in your human status, in this case from either girl category one to girl category two, or, or I don't know, um, A to B, or maybe from girl to woman. Uh, I, I can't tell, but it's definitely an initiation. And then it's clear that after this is all over, then we go to a new set of virgins who will do the same thing for the next year. So I, I, I quite agree. And I think the fact that it's a descent is a simulation of death. Obviously, there's death and sex because they have to go through the gardens of Aphrodite. And then I love the fact that um, there's things that are not to be seen and then things to be seen. And I would imagine what, what happens somewhere in this ritual is that they get to see something, but because they're ritual agents, they don't die the way the mythological agents whom they're replicating do die. And, and I love the fact that one of them stays behind. There are only two of them. It's not clear from Pausanias but this is another thing I have to do over the weekend, is check, I swear to you, dozens and dozens of references to Are Foroi in Greek lexicographical traditions. And they're all incomplete. And what you have to do is kind of say, all right, here elements A, B, C are present, but D, E, F are missing. And then the other one, it's D, E, F that's present, A, B, C is missing or A and B are missing, it's just a terrible mess. And uh, in some of these lexicographical traditions, they're called Arre Foroi and others Erre Foroi. And the Erre Foroi, I, I used to think, oh, that's just a facile way of, of explaining what the names of the Arre Foroi are. But now I'm beginning to think that I think they're both legitimate. I'm sorry for this interminably long answer to your beautiful question but um, but it, and I, I just like the way you highlighted um, the element of anthropology I think um, if you if you invite any anthropologist to look at this they'll say oh yeah this is a classic example of initiation 
Jojo, I saw that you had your hand up. And then then Anne. Oh, yes, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to say, uh, perhaps uh, it would be of, uh, of relevance to mention that the RF4 actually are the first uh, age group of maidens, little girls, who are initiated. Um, Aristophanes and Lysistrata said, I was by seven, I was RF4. And then he goes on with this next function, next function. So maturity perhaps would be a step too much, but initiation and kind of leaving a world behind and entering another world is um, perhaps more close to to the original context. And actually, I was um, thank you, thanks to your uh, um, uh, presentation, uh, I was forced to dig a bit further, and I was actually fascinated by the controversy, as you uh, pointed out, uh, among the scholars. Who are these uh, RFOR? I mean, there is this even a kind of a controversial freeze on Parthenon, where you have bigger girls carrying something, and for many years, and even in official sites, they are taken as these little girls, for which, let's say, others like Booker and you say, no, it can't be because they're too old to be <laughs> to be that. Uh, so, so it's it's really a fascinating topic. That's the thing we don't know many things, so we assume um, much more. Um, I find very interesting, you know, the uh, the part of the myth about the sister that's left behind, the Pandrosos, yes, which actually even in the ritual becomes a goddess herself, and there were statues dedicated to her yes. as well. Yes. So. She, so um, this is a very, I think, um, uh, interesting point, uh, perhaps for us to linger. And um, another thing that caught my attention is that this ritual is connected to uh, Athena Polias, which is the uh, goddess of peace. And this is perhaps something we should keep in the back of our head, as, oh, yes. as opposed to the Athena Palace. You know. In I, 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 I love what you said. And could I say, that I, I, I agree with you, and I'm so glad you mentioned the passage in Aristophanes' Lysistrata, or Lysistrate, where there's a reference to a very early age for being an Arephoros, very, very, very early. And, and so, um, yes, I, I do think that to say that this is a, a, a graduation from age class girl one to girl two is more likely than girl to woman. Um, and in general, you know, it fascinates me that what we know about haircuts in Minoan and in general Aegean civilization suggests that they were so civilized that they had many, many, many age classes for adolescent girls and boys. And in general, the more complex the society, the more they have a retardation of adulthood and more and more sub-steps. And, and in Minoan iconography, you can see that with different haircuts. And for example, in the Theron frescoes, uh, there is one kind of haircut which is, is given obviously to the youngest female category where the, the scalp is shaved except for a ponytail. And I think maybe bangs, I forget, but, but you know, there's a lot of square inches are shaved off and then accentuating some areas. And it's very clear that there are at least three or four age classes for, for females and, and maybe even more age classes for males in, in Aegean iconography, or as we see in Aegean iconography in the second millennium. You said so many things that are important. Yes, there are cults of these girls. If you look at them in terms of myth, that, that feature them as divinities. And, and then there are other situations where they seem to be heroes. And then there's still other situations where it's ordinary girls, not ordinary because not ordinary because they're aristocratic, but aristocratic girls who are reenacting in ritual what is happening. So my goodness, a lot of things going on. And, um, and, and I'm glad you also pointed out that some of the greatest experts on Greek religion, like Burkert, who's a very smart man, uh, I, I think gets very, I don't know, 
confusing, at least to me, about his overall view and his criteria about what's too old or what's too young and all of that. So, so I, I'm already very nervous about my promise to Keith that I'll hand in something on Monday or Tuesday because this is such a big topic, such a big topic. And yes. Oops. Can you hear me? Yeah, now, yes. yes. Oh. Oops, now I can't again. Right, try again. Okay, okay. yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm interested in the snake. Yeah. And um, forgive me, I might have missed if you'd said this, but did they open the basket before they took it down? Or did they open the basket after they brought it? Were they taking the snake into the earth or were they bringing the snake to the earth from the underworld? And, and I also wondered about the meaning of the snake because sometimes a snake is the devil, isn't it? And sometimes it's wisdom. And I thought maybe, maybe they were bringing wisdom to the earth. <laughs> I, I, I agree with you, Anne, that, that the snake is very ambivalent in, in Greek yeah. myth and ritual. It, it, and let's not say devil, but let's say um, it, it can be chthonic, associated right. with death, but it's also associated with, um, with regeneration because when the snake mm -hmm. sheds its skin every year, it leaves behind the, the old um, exterior and has a new exterior out of the interior, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And after all, think of the fact that um, Athena's sidekick is a snake. Mm, yes. Um, I, um, in, in one of my earlier comments in Classical Inquiries, I, I just go on and on and on about how um, the, the, the first Athenian can be pictured as either all human or half human, half snake, or all snake. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you where you see um, the proto Athenian uh, human as all snake, and that's right next to the statue of Athena Parthenos, where her sidekick is a snake. And then Pausanias is, oh, he's very, very um, um, uh, embarrassed, but he says it in a potential optative. He says, well, that snake next to Athena, now that would be Eric Thonius. So Eric Thonius right. can run the gamut from, from all human to all snake, and then in between, like the baby um, who's in the basket, half human, half snake. Mm -hmm. And what you said about, I love the way you said, well, um, what's the progression here? In the myth, it's clear that they're up there on the Acropolis and the two, two girls out of the three open the basket. And then what do they do? They, they, they jump to their death um, off the cliffs, uh, off the steepest part of the, of the Acropolis. Mm -hmm. But I think in the ritual, what happens, instead of jumping off, they, they have a um, ritual descent, a kathodos, which is still the equivalent of going from the top to the bottom but now it's it's safe because it's ritual and you don't really get killed you just get notionally killed and so I, i'm guessing I, i'm guessing that that they um, that they 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 open the thing and then they march down and contemplate it or something or some mm -hmm. such progression so where, where it happens as a big bang in myth you have a um, a procession in mm. which is that okay like it's slowing it down it's like it's like the killing of bonnie and clyde in the movie <laughs> where uh, i think that was the first slow motion death scene yeah. in, in movies where you, you see them in their white suits and then the bullets are riddling their bodies and mm. you see all these gaps red gaps in their white suits and 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 arterial blood flowing but it's so, so slow motion that it's ritualized. And I think that's what happens with the ritual version of the Are Foroi. Their kathodos mm -hmm. is safe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you. I love your question.
Greg, you mentioned that the the daughters of Kekrops discovered that they themselves are yes. mixed with snake somehow. <laughs> yes. Um, how clearly is is that said somewhere? I forget exactly. Other well, it isn't part. said somewhere. It's just your friend Greg saying, "I think that's okay." What <laughs> okay. No, I, I love the idea. And, and it's in that commentary in one of the earlier installments of classical inquiry. So, if you nice people um, look for autochthonous or autochthon in classical inquiries, you'll see a whole progression where Greg develops this idea of of um, a, a continuum from all snake to all human. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I just I just feel so inadequate talking about this. It's so complicated. And you know, we haven't even uh, uh, somebody should force me to talk about how in the lexicographical tradition, these girls uh, either take a hand or supposedly do it all. They're the weavers of the robe of Athena. Mm. And, I'll make you talk course, about that in a second. I see that Astrid has a, a question. Oh, good. Thank you. Yes. No, uh, yes. Uh, you know, I'm. You know, I'm. I'm amazed by the myth. And one thing that really, uh, I want to ask you about it is the choice of uh, verbs, like sort of circulars. You have carry and take, leave behind, leave beside, bring back. This yeah. myth lead. It's like circulars. It's like you know the cycle of life. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And and I like the way that it is. Uh, you know, written the way that it's written, uh, doing this ca contraposition between verbs. And then the amount of words that indicate the sin. You yes. have cathodos, catenai, kato, like, yes. you know, indicating where the climax, the climax takes yes. place. Yes, oh, I love it. Yes. And, and I, I'll let you finish. I, 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 I don't no, 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 I'm finished. I'm finished. <laughs> I want to hear you. <laughs> no, no, no. So, um, a couple of things. If again you look at uh, classical inquiries, the search engine that Keith has is to die for. Oops, wrong word. That's too ritual. Um, but anyway, it's a very good search engine, and I, I would love it if you look for um, "girl interrupted," which is a, a meditation on um, on myths about deaths of girls and. And I deliberately used that expression that was part of, it was the title of an autobiography of, I, I'm now forgetting her name, but it's a book called Girl Interrupted. And it's about um, um, all sorts of traumas that happen to a, a, a girl and how she becomes a woman. And, and it, it involves McLean's Hospital. Have any of you heard of Girl Interrupted? It, it, it's really worth looking at. But anyway, could I now come to Athena herself and her and her favorite partner, <laughs> the snake or the proto king of Athens, Erichthonios? He can be both, you know, or, or he can be in between. Uh, I personally am very uh, taken with the book of Joan Connolly called The Parthenon Enigma, or I think that's what it's called. And, and I think a lot of people have criticized it um, unfairly by taking too literally some of the words that she uses, like human sacrifice. And, and so it, it, it doesn't necessarily get a good press from classicists, but I, I think she's really onto something when she a analyzes that big slab on the east side of the Panathenaic frieze where you see what I think and what she thinks is an adolescent female, a girl, um, interacting with what she thinks and I think is the, is the priest of Athens, the, the, the proto-priest king of Athens, and how the whole thing is a kind of, how shall I say it, a human dimension meditation on the goddess Athena. There's a big deal how that young adolescent does not have a name. She's just called the Parthenos, the Virgin. And I, I think in the human dimension of the story, 
she gets killed. In the divine dimension, she is the Parthenos, the grown-up Parthenos, who is Athena and who is um, represented by the gigantic, the colossal um, golden ivory statue that we know as uh, Athena Parthenos. So there's something about even uh, the myth of, of human sacrifice where a girl gives up her life for the community, but somehow morphs into the goddess Athena uh, in another dimension. Again, very difficult to talk about. We're 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 almost doing too much at, all at once, and I, I I get more and more panicked about how I'm going to write this up for next week. But maybe by giving um, sort of open-ended headlines about how various things must be related to each other without trying to connect all the dots. But you can see I really enjoyed your question and it's taking me in all these other directions that I think are relevant, you know. Maybe it's time now for you to talk about um, the Arefroi as weavers of the Peplos. Yes, yes, yes. So uh, here's the deal, <laughs> I think, and, and this is not controversial. It's pretty clear that every four years there is the big, the so-called greater Panathenaea, and, and that's so big, it has so outgrown the original or the earlier parameters of the festival of Our Lady of Athens that you even have, get this, male weavers doing the actual weaving of the robe of the goddess. And, and, and that, that every fourth year, greater Panathenaic Peplos is so big that it is, as Sarah will remember, we saw it a few days ago, it is mounted on the, the mast of a gigantic Athenian ship of state, which is, um, which is on wheels and which is rolled down the pathway of the Panathenaic festival, so that the, the robe of Athena, which is as large as a sail, can be seen by everybody far and wide who attends the ritual. So that is a masterpiece of pattern weaving that, and we even know this, is, is done by professional male weavers. But then the other um, instances of the Panathenaic festival, the so-called lesser ones, you know, it goes in a, in a cycle of four. Um, one, two, three, four is the big one. One, two, three, four is the big one. One, two, three, four is the big one. And because Greeks don't have zeros, and Romans don't have zeros. Um, they talk about the fifth Panathenaic festival, which for us is the fourth. Um, again, because they have to be um, inclusive, so to speak. Um, anyway, this so-called pentateric or four, or or greater Panathenaic peplos is so big, but then in the other years, in the off years, it, it reverts to, the whole thing reverts to what it must have been originally, or should I say it must have been earlier, where it is the selected female weavers who accomplish uh, the weaving, and where the, um, the garment, the robe, is not gigantic, uh, oversized, but, uh, can I say human-sized? And the areforoi are the designated weavers. Now, some experts have said they're probably not that skilled in pattern weaving, so they have older women helping them. But officially, they're the debutantes who do the uh, the weaving. They're the ones who get the credit, et cetera, et cetera. Could I go back to something that was said earlier about um, Lysistrata, that is to say, the, um, the, the work of Aristophanes called the Lysistrata, where Lysistrata reminisces about being an areforos. Okay. I just wanted to point out that um, um, I, I mentioned her name just a minute ago. Joan Connolly has a very good argument to show 
that Lysistrata of Aristophanes was based on a real head priestess of Athens, that is to say, priestess of Athena, who was called Lucy Mache, Lucy Mache, not Lucy Strate, okay, meaning the same thing, the the dissolution of war, in, in other words, the um, making of peace. And and um, it's a good bet that Aristophanes' Lucy Strate, Lysistrata, was modeled on a, a real live priestess of Athena who got very involved in politics during uh, that particular era. And I would, I would give anything to see the beginning of the Panathenaic festival where we have from some sources the fact that when, when the priestess of Athena comes into the area, the public area where the climactic moments of the ritual take place, and everybody uh, stands up for her because at that point she is channeling the goddess Athena herself. So lots of really interesting things about the, the priestess of the, the chief priestess of Athena. Now I'm hyperventilating because there's so much. <laughs> I saw that someone had dug up the name of uh, Girl Interrupted, uh, the author oh, of that. Oh, God. Um, is it Kazen? Uh, is that Kazen. her last name? And what's her first name? I'm Suzanne, I think I saw. Yeah, that's Susanna, right. Susanna Kazen, Girl yeah. Interrupted. Yes. It, it's a beautiful work. And they yes. made a film out of it, which is also very interesting. With, with Winona Ryder. I think yes. it was it was Sofia Coppola who directed yes. it. Oh, I, I love Sofia Coppola's work. Yes, yeah. and not only not only Winona Ryder, but also, um, um, what's her name? Jolie, what's her name? Um, Angelina. Angelina, Angelina Jolie, Jolie was, was yes. also in it, yep. Yeah. So it's definitely worth seeing. Further questions? Further comments? Um, Greg, I would like uh, to just to ask you about what we may call the silences of the sources, either yes. lexicographical sources. Is there anything that we can extrapolate from these silences? Well, let's start with Pausanias. I, 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 I introduced the whole uh, discussion dear Maria, by talking about um, how I, I think Pausanias himself is a very religious person. Then I backed off from using the word religion because I, I, I really do think it can mislead us. But let's say he's very observant of ritual and myth. And time and again, when he goes to a new place, he will even say, well, I had a good conversation with the local priestess or the local priest. He's very interested in what priests, male or female, have to say. And I love the fact that when he gets into certain situations, for example, when he goes to the building uh, along the Sacred Way of Athens that is called the Eleusinion, he, he goes in and he says, I had a dream, or I, I forget how, I don't know why he, used, maybe he had an incubation and and they're a dream. And he says, but I can't tell you what I dreamed. Oh, okay. <laughs> but but, but there's, there are things that where, where he expects to be respected for, just as you say, dear Maria, just being silent about some things. And I go back to, I'm pretty happy with my, my etymology, the etymology I have proposed for the verb mule, M-U, O, with a long mark over the O, where the word means I have my mouth closed and I have my eyes closed uh, in, in, in some situations, but where it also means I have my mouth open and, and talking and I have my eyes open and seeing in other situations. And it's all a matter of whether you are in the zone of what is sacred or whatever, and or whether you're outside that zone. And when you're outside the zone of the sacred, then your verbalization and visualization shuts down. When you're inside, it opens up. So that's what mule means. And, and, and technically, it should mean uh, shut down. But it also means, of course, 
open up. Um, and you, you see that also in a paraphrase, and that's the verb euphemeo, which gives us the word euphemism. But if you look at the ancient context of that, it can mean just be radio silent. It's just to be silent or to say things in a whisper, um, but definitely not to say things in your ordinary profane way, you know? So that's euphemio, uh, and that's euphemism. And in a way, that's what's happening when, when we do euphemisms. Um, um, uh, we, um, we don't quite verbalize it, we don't quite visualize it. Um, how about, I'm just wondering about the other lexica, I, I don't know, uh, do we uh, have other, for example, Byzantine lexica have lemmatized areforoi like Photios, for example, or other Byzantine lexicographers? Yes, oh yes, and, and, and that's that's what I was complaining about, <laughs> where, where um, you have different bits and pieces in different um, lexica. Um, there's the Photios, there's the so-called etymologicum magnum, there's Hesychius. All of these sources have, have information about areforoi or erreforoi. They all do. And to put them all together makes your head spin. And again, maybe why not? I mean, this is the premier um, event of initiation for aristocratic uh, young females who are um, representatives of all women of Athens, all, all females of Athens, uh, and who are, are deeply connected, as Keith said at the very beginning, with, with Athena and Aphrodite. And by the way, if you put those two goddesses together, I think you have the earlier mother goddess of Athens. <laughs> in, in other words, how, how shall I say it? Athena and Aphrodite, as we see them, in the classical period and then in the period as as mediated by by um, Pausanias. Could, could I make a joke there like eye, ear, nose, throat specialists versus general practitioners of what a goddess should be? Well, that was very disrespectful. Oh, sorry, Jack, go ahead. Go ahead I was sorry. just gonna say, uh, I, I looked at this a little bit, I'm late to the party. Uh, sorry, but um, the the uh, the etymologicum genuinum that uh, Millet uh, reported mm -hmm. in the 19th century uh, relates these uh, glosses in the Magnum to Seleucius, who wrote a commentary on Callimachus's Ecale. Yes, yes. So, you know, it really does. I mean, even though it's a late Byzantine, yeah. Lexicon, it's carrying forward uh, a very detailed oh, yes. that a that a scholar of Callimachus, you know, which really oh, yes. quite a lot to to be, uh, oh, yes. had written on. And, and and I quite agree with you that that Callimachus is a gold mine for um, for very precise information about ritual and myth and how the how ritual and myth interact. Um, he, he he is. Uh, I, I wish we had more of him, but at, at least we do have, as you say, um, wonderful transmission of, of things that were originally found in his works, like the Hecale, um, that have survived. But but I still say it's very frustrating to look at the bits and pieces, the way <laughs> the bits and pieces survive. But point well taken. Point well taken, Jack. Well, Greg, you've been working on the Lucinian mysteries for a long time, and uh, I know you've seen those glosses in Ezekiel, where the yeah. Aratus uh, Chore is Persephone. Oh yeah. And I'm wondering how, how, uh, uh, you know, it's the mystery. So, yeah. and Aeschylus got in a lot of trouble, you know, for <laughs> disclosing some little bit of the mysteries. <laughs> So I guess it's not surprising that yeah. it's it's there just in fragments here and there and you know a little slip of them. You no, know, I'm not, I'm not surprised. Nothing surprises me anymore. <laughs> but, <laughs> but but what's funny is is that the word that Jack uses, uh, mysteries, mysterion, is from that verb muo, which means I have my 
mouth shut, my eyes shut in, in non-sacred situations, but I have my mouth open and my eyes open in, in sacred situations. That is a mystery. And, and, and the thing is that there are situations where it's off limits, and I'm afraid that Pausanias is kind of careful with us. He'll say, okay, a lot of people don't know anything about this. I'll write it down, but what he writes down is not enough. <laughs> it's so not enough. <laughs> so, Greg, I wonder if I could maybe pick up on something you were mentioning earlier about how, if I've understood it, Athena and Aphrodite, as it were, are perhaps um, representations of aspects of an earlier, maybe mother goddess. That, yes. I wondered if that might, because I was curious about why the priestess in this particular ritual, who is therefore, as it were, representing Athena, would not yes. know what was in the basket. But then <laughs> they descend via Aphrodite. So is that sort of as it were, one aspect knows and one doesn't? Or is that something to do with eyes, eyes and mouth shut and eyes and mouth opening as they descend? Or I don't know. I'm just trying to I think love it. I, I love what you said, Sarah, because after all, in the myth, um, one of the three girls does not look. And well, she does not open the basket and doesn't look. And she's the one who survives. What if she's the priestess? <laughs> And, and, and there is a kind of pretend not knowing because she didn't go through what the other two girls did. And then this priestess sends the other two down <laughs> in, in that descent, which in the myth is a, um, a free fall <laughs> because they, they jump off the precipice, whereas in the ritual is a, de a gradual descent of... Um, I guess I'm still thinking of gradually opening your eyes and gradually starting to speak. I don't know. It's, uh, it's, uh, but I do think that myth tends to go for the big bang while ritual is, is goes for the procession where it's a process it, it, and you go from A to Z. <laughs> I love your question. Yeah, Georgia. Uh, yes, um, now it comes up to me uh, that uh, Ovid's version of the myth has Pandrosos and Hersey together being innocent, and only Aglaros is the one who's guilty in, by looking. Mm. Mm. And uh, it's, uh, I mean, you could say that because of the etymolo etymological relation, they're put together. But somehow it just uh, struck to me uh, that perhaps uh, he sees or he interprets or he would like to see that actually the, then in the ritual, the two girls are innocent because they're supposed not to look. And the ritual is completed by them uh, um, having carried out the task without committing, let's say, the original, the archetypical error. Just. Yeah, you're here. I love that. And you know what I love about it is that, um, I mean, look, Ovid is very smart and, and he has internalized Greek myth and he may tweak, or, or not tweak, but present variants that, that suit his, his, his rather naughty way of rethinking myth. But in general, because Ovid is Ovid, um, I think he must also be thinking of what seems to be the case that it, what was in the basket, okay, in, um, in Ovid, it's, 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 it could be all human or could be all snake, which is a way of saying half human, half snake. But there are other versions where it can be, I don't know how to say this um, in a delicate way, but it could be a penis in the shape of a cookie or uh, something baked. And, um, and so it's, um, you know, it's a little bit like Freud's obsession with what happens in, in that wonderful novel, um, the, the, of Apuleius, uh, and the sub novel, which is Cupid and Psyche and what is seen and what is not seen. And, um, I don't know. Um, I, I, I shouldn't go in the direction of Freud, but what I am saying is that ritual it does seem to have something to do with 
sex education as well. Can I put it that way? Um, I don't know. And, and I probably won't even try to, uh, to uh, um, speculate on that in what I give to Keith because uh, unless I find a really good um, testimony for it. But thank you for bringing it up. I, I hope I've, I've taken this in an interesting direction. I don't know. Maria. Perhaps one uh, final question. Uh, first of all, I would like also to, to remind you a cinematographical uh, tit a, a, a title from a movie, The uh, Eyes Wide Shut, for your yes. next. <laughs> Yes, what, what, where, where Kubrick <laughs> played. Yeah, exactly. Stanley Kubrick's Eyes Wide Shut, probably for, for your next uh, etymological uh, yes, attempt. Yes, yes. Uh, now, I would like your comment. I would like to comment uh, for, for us uh, your uh, contribution when you, I think you wrote something on, on classical inquiries uh, about the oath or the uh, the young Athenian oath. So, and uh, I would like us to, uh, I would like you to connect this for us with the Arifori, the names, yes, and yes. what you just called the new um environmental stance yes yes, yes. um I, I find it fascinating that that the the ephibes have to swear by the cacropidas and i forget whether i now can't remember whether it's all three of them or only only of laudos i can't remember but 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 they definitely have to swear and this goes back to an earlier conversation where um, th these kekropidas can be worshipped as almost goddesses or at least heroes, cult heroes, I, I'm not sure, but definitely guardians of nature and guardians of, the, of, of male initiation. It's interesting that what Pausanias is doing here is female initiation but these Kekropidas are also relevant to male initiation because it's the male citizen cadets who have to patrol the countryside of Athens and, and they can't go home and sleep in their own beds. They have to, they have to sleep out of doors. That's, and, and that's what the name of Aglauros means. It's Agraulos. It's to, to, to camp outdoors, to camp outdoors in the fields. So it, it, it's something that cuts across gender. It's both male and female initiation. Uh, and um, and uh, this, this proto-Athenian group of three sisters are very essential to all. And I would say that they are, I could think of them as variations on the theme of Athena herself, when Athena is, is, is the, is the mother virgin virgin mother who keeps recycling every year from one to the other and and um, the, the priestess and the attendants of the priestess somehow reenact this as in pausanias i'm guess i'm guessing there's i mean it's boiled down to the basics i'm guessing one priestess and two are for all i'm guessing who are then replaced by two new areforoi every year after this after this descent? Ooh, difficult. Well, I wish we could go on, but our time is coming to a close. So, I think so shall we? Shall we close our eyes and mouth? <laughs> exactly, close the hangout, etc. So thanks for joining us, Greg, once again. Well, this was such a delight. Thank you for joining me, and I love your comments. And, um, and maybe, dear Keith, we can share with this gang my draft as it, as it comes along, because they're now part of the creative process. <laughs> or if it's creative, it may be destructive. <laughs> it might destroy us all. <laughs> well, let's hope for the best. We, we might all jump off the precipice after this is over. <laughs> We have to be careful. <laughs> you have to be very careful. <laughs> Eyes wide shut. <laughs> all right. Okay. Bye, Thank all. You all. See you next time. Bye. Bye.